early morning Bible study. This is not worship. This is before worship. So it lets you know what your mindset is when you want to come and get a little bit extra. And when it comes to God, you always want to get whatever he has for you. Always through Bible study, we literally dig into the mind of God through his 66 books. So before we begin, we do as we always do. We take everything to the Lord in prayer. Bow with me, please. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we come to you on this bright and early first day of the week morning, Heavenly Father. Give me praise and honor unto you through our reasonable service, and that is digging into a Bible study, Heavenly Father. Help us as we continue our venture through the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. Help us to obtain everything that you would have us to have, Heavenly Father, to be perfect ambassadors on this side of life to your, for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. I always start off with, if you have any questions, try to keep them pertinent to the topic or lesson at hand. If you have any other questions, you all know you can get with me anytime you choose. But without further ado, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. I love how Paul says this. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Usually when we hear the word prisoner, that's not something that we want to connect with, is it? What's the benefit here in verse 1? Why is Paul saying that? Any insight? Brother Charles. Paul said he was in prison in Rome. But why is that a benefit to us? Remember, that's the context of the question is why is that a benefit for us? Yes, sir. That's true, but it says prisoner here. What does that allude to? Go ahead. You still have the floor. And next, um, I think uh, I forgot which chapter it was. He was preaching and he was rejected by the Jews. Mm -hmm. So much so that he says that he would go to the Gentiles. That's true, but I'm still getting to that word prisoner. <laughs> you you all are alluding to it, but we got we have to go back to that word. Now he did become a prisoner in Rome because he was preaching to the Gentiles. I and mean, obviously the Jews didn't like that. But what is that prisoner? It's it's not so much just being a prisoner, but it says prisoner of Jesus Christ. See, when Christ is in the mix, it's always a benefit for you, no matter what comes up. If it says you, Christ, it doesn't matter what the rest of it says. You knew you, you know you're okay, right? No matter if you're in prison like John was, you're in the, the, the innermost parts of the jail as uh, 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 the Apostle Paul was in Acts chapter 1. As long as Jesus is there with you, it doesn't matter where you are because you know it's going to be all right. At least you know it's going to come out to the way that God would have it to come out. The word prisoner there, the, the word is similar to the Greek word doulos. The word doulos means slave or servant. Now that still doesn't, you got servant, slave, and prisoner. It's like, ah. Uh, but don't look at slave or servant like we look at the modern day English word. It's completely different. I think I've told you all this a lot of times. That Greek word is doulos, which literally translated as slave or servant, but it means you're so caught up in accomplishing the goal of your master, and in so doing, he will more than take care of you. Imagine having a contract like that with a master. You do my will, I will more than take care of you. I don't know about you all, but I'll take that job any day of the week. More than take care of me? I just want you to take care of me, but more than take care of me? That's the blessing. And Paul here says, he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, a servant of Jesus Christ for whose purpose? The Gentiles. Last time I checked, that was us before we were saved. That's a blessing, folks. See, many times we stop at the word slave, but it's who is your master is what it, what it accounts to. Even if we look back to uh, African-American slavery, which was brutal, absolutely brutal. As it came toward the end, I remember reading stories about some slaves said, no, 
we chose to stay on that plantation. And I said, why? Because he paid us and he took care of us and gave us a good place to stay. You see, it wasn't caught up in the, the slavery part. It's, can I survive? Can I have freedom? And they still had all that and still worked for the man that was treated unfairly. Believe it or not, that's what the book of Phil uh, Philemon is all about. It's about a slave owner and a slave. And they both were Christian, so there should be a different kind of relationship. Follow me? But Paul said he was a prisoner for, of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Those who just came in were in Ephesians 3. Now we're in verse 2. Verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, were, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. First of all, who can define mystery for me in this context? And what mystery is he talking about? As you think mystery, ooh, we don't know what it is. What is this talking about? I'm gonna grab a water where y'all think about it. Let's start with the definition first. But the definition gets a lot of people mixed up. What's the definition of mystery in the Greek, in the Koine Greek that is? Just to look out. Something unknown, it's a little bit the more precise definition is a, is a hidden truth. It's a truth. So, what does that tell you? Something that you need to, to reach for and search for, but it's hidden. Can, is something hidden? Can it be revealed? As prior to us being saved, did we really know what the gospel was? But somebody taught us, didn't they? And it became clear. I remember when preacher at West Oakland Church of Christ, he tied, we don't have time to go to it, but in when you read uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 9, it lets you know that Christ is coming in flaming fire, and he's going to take vengeance on those who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. And I said, well, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. He said, yes. I said, how can you obey that? You're going to nail me, going to, nail me to a cross? He says, no, go to the scripture and we'll find the answer. I was like, I want to know that scripture. He went to Romans 6. And as you all know, Romans 6 lets us know we obey the death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized. See, I would have never known that if that hidden truth wasn't revealed to me through one of God's messengers. And that's our job to take it unto the world. This was the mystery that Paul was talking about. That simple fact that a lot of people wouldn't obey that it's keeping them from the kingdom of God. And that's sad, isn't it? The Bible makes it clear. What do we mean by, I don't want to skip over these words. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. First of all, what's a dispensation? I know I'm in a room full of scholars. What's a dispensation? We never want to skip over them. Keep in mind, I'm a reading teacher. I can't skip over these words. It'll bother me all to drive on. Charles, what's the dispensation? Mm -hmm. Another word for it is an age. A period is, will it last forever? No, 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 no. Just like you said, it's a period of time. Now, in the Bible, how many dispensations do we have? Three. What's the first one? Come on, Charles, you can't stop now. Patriarchal age. In other words, God did what? Spoke to the head of the household. Give me one example. Abraham. Abraham's always a safe answer if you go to Old Testament. <laughs> I like people who go, Abraham. <laughs> that is correct. Then after that dispensation, we moved on to what? The Mosaic or the Law and the Prophets. And then from there, where do we go to? This is the one that we're in now. You can say the Christian age, the church age, or the age of what and truth. Grace and truth. That's the age we're in now. And this is the age that Christ is supposed to return. So what can we say about this age? I like to say every day that we're living. Now, does anybody know when Christ is going to return? 
Don't let any foolish cult lead you to believe that they can tell you what day. Because they tried it many times and they keep changing the day. If you keep changing the day, one time you're going to get it right. I remember my gunny, he had a broken clock in the armor and it stayed on 101. He said, well, let's write at least one, at least twice a day. <laughs> Even if it never got it fixed, it'd be right twice a day. One thing that we know is as long as we live on this side of life and this dispensation, we're one day closer to salvation. So we can look over and say, ooh, happy first day of the week. We're one day closer to salvation. We don't know when. It could be any minute now. It could be later on this week. But we know that it's coming. Does that make sense? The Bible continues in verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. I kind of covered what we just said. If you read and study, you'll find these hidden truths, will you not? And there's a lot, I think I told you all, people ask me, what was the one that stood out the most for you? Obviously, the gospel of Christ. But I remember when I was reading, no one had taught me this. I was reading, I've always loved the book of Daniel because he was a wonderful man of God. And we were reading Daniel 2.44, and it says, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. I was like, is that talking about heaven? It wasn't talking about heaven. It was talking about something else. So I said, in the days of these keys, let me go back and study this through history. And you see Nebuchadnezzar's image. And his image went up all the way from where? Remember, they came out of Egypt to the statue. Anybody remember the layers of gold? Went from Egypt to the Persian, I mean, to the Persians. And the Persians, and the Persians mixed with the Medes. And then the Medes with the Grecians. And then who took over the Greeks? The Romans. You study that time period, guess what the time period was? The time of the Romans. And then I read in Acts, around Acts 2, and it said, the last verse, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church. The first time it being spoken of as an establishment, not a prophecy, was mentioned. I looked up the period of time. It was a between 80, 33, and 35. Guess what, guess what the world power was at that time? The Romans. God let Daniel say this many hundred years ago. You don't think that, that touched my faith? See, that was a hidden truth that was revealed only through God's word. I love reading Apologetics Press. They got a lot of things out. You know, you all know Christopher Columbus. You know, during his time, they actually thought the world was flat. Crazy as that sounds now, they thought you could, you had to be careful. You could sail so far and you could literally fall off the side of the earth. That sounds ludicrous today. But you go to the book of the Bible, Job and Psalms, and it talks about the circumference or the vault, meaning circle, of the earth. Now, how could men hundreds of years and they weren't scientists. How could they know that and write that? And yet modern men saw it as flat. One word, G-O-D. God revealed it to me. And there are many other ones. You know, it was even noted, I was reading Apologetics Press as well, it was even noted that for years around Christopher Columbus time, they felt that the number of stars was about 3,000. You know what the Bible said many of years before they said it? Stars were innumerable. Guess who was right? The Bible. Because God created the whole thing. That should be more. And there's a lot of other really, really neat things, facts in there that science is catching up with it now. I like to say, it's not that the Bible and the science disagree. They actually agree you give science more time. But Pastors and scientists disagree because they're still caught up in evolution, things that can't even be proved. But there's a lot of wonderful things in the Bible, a lot of hidden truths that are revealed for those that are willing to take the time to study with an open mind. Does that make sense? And there's none greater than the mystery of the gospel. Because out of all the power that God used to do all these things, 
what power did he use toward mankind? This said Paul tell us in Romans 1 and 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the power that he used toward us. That's the most precious power. Questions, comments about anything before we continue? Any confusion? Verse 5, let us continue in Ephesians 3. Which in other ages, notice that's plural. Because as, as Charles clearly delineated, there was more than one dispensation. We happen to be in the last one, but there were two before ours. When in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the, that should be Holy Spirit, the Spirit with a capital S. It wasn't made known unto them. You know, a, a metaphor I like to use to explain this. We had mentioned three metaphors, right? The first, I mean, three dispensations. The first dispensation was the what? Patriarchal, right? Did the patriarchal give the world some insight about God, a little bit of light? Yes, let's just say it was starlight. At night, the stars give you light, but is it a whole lot of light? Not a lot of light, but it's some light. And then we move on to the mosaical dispensation. Did we get a little bit more light on God's plan of salvation? Now, it wasn't complete, but we got a little bit more. Let's call that the moonlight. Does the moon give you some light? Does it give you more than stars? But it's still not a whole lot if you're in the jungle like I was, the brother Danny. I mean, you still had to wait till morning. <laughs> and then the third dispensation, we call grace and truth, the church age, a Christ age. Does this give us the light? It gives us more than both of the other ones combined, right? Because it's sunlight, play on the word sun. And what's funny about all of that, where did the moon and the stars get their light from? The sun. The sun and the stars don't just light up. They're reflecting the sun. See how it all comes together? But the most light we get is in, the, is in this dispensation. Abraham and all of them knew about eventually a coming Messiah, but they didn't know about the plan of salvation. It wasn't revealed yet. They just had to do what they were responsible for. Let us continue. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, that may sound like, okay, that makes sense. That we understand that. Understand to Jews, that was a heavy pill to swallow. Anybody know of an example where they argued over what the, what the uh, Jews were supposed to do? I mean, what the Gentiles were supposed to do? You got your Bibles, go back to Acts 15. Watch this mighty man, Peter, man of God, stand up. But notice the verbiage. Acts chapter 15. The context is Peter is arguing with the Jewish elders. And they're arguing over what the Gentile child must do to be saved or become part of the church. Let me go into the scripture first. Okay. Acts 15 and verse 7. Look how it starts off. When there had been much disputing. What's the, what does disputing mean? Arguing conflict, that's right. When well, there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us. In other words, God chose the Jews first, right? But look at what he's doing now. That the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the, what word is that? Gospel and believe. You know what the Jewish elders were requiring upon the Gentiles? Brother Charles, circumcision. And I always like to remind people, we're talking about adults. Now, you know, usually when are, even now, outside of the Jewish law, when are people circumcised? When are men circumcised? Yeah, baby, thank God. 
Because if they called a part of the 50-year-old man, brother, brother Danny, you all would know when it would happen to me because the whole world would hear me scream. But who did God give the, the, the covenant of circumcision to specifically? Charles, you rolled it. No, specifically, though. Specifically, it's to the Jews, but who did he give it to? No, specifically. I hear mumbling. The only one I hear clearly is Charles. If you're saying something, say it. He gave it to Abraham to pass on to the Jews. And that is that every male child on what day? Eighth day would be circumcised. The Jewish elders in Acts 15 was trying to put this on the Gentile men. That's horrible. Do we see some things like that today? Because all that really is, is taking something from God's old law and trying to put it into his new law. What do we have to be careful of? If you visit denominational churches, you'll see, and here's Reverend So-So. What's wrong with that? They take, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, because it's on, on the what does it say? Very good. So that name is reserved for God. We got men walking around town wearing it. The chest puffed out. We even got a man called a Pope who calls himself Most Heavenly Father. Can you imagine that? Even if I didn't know the Bible, I'd say, I got to check that out. That's a man, he can get sick. Last time I checked, the current Pope is sick as a dog. What happened to all this power? And as soon as he passes away or moves on, they got to vote in another one? You think that's how God operates? No. God has sent his representative, and it's Jesus the Christ, and he's the only one. Go to the nominational churches, you'll hear, here's the reverend, and here's the first lady. Now, she may be his first lady, but is there a first lady in the church? No, that sounds cute, but is it doctrine? And it can mislead people because then you start lifting people up that the Bible doesn't mention. Notice how the Catholic Church, don't they uplift Mary? Boy, do they. I remember I was debating a young man and he said, well, what's wrong with that? She carried baby Jesus. And I said, I know that was a blessing. She was picked as a vessel. I was like, well, then why don't you lift up John the Baptist? He did some amazing things. Why are you picking Mary? You shouldn't pick either one. They serve God faithfully unto death. That's like we're supposed to do. We got to be careful adding subtle things in that can erode from the truth. And it can happen in such subtle ways. Now let's talk about us, the Church of Christ. What we got to be careful of is this thing called entertainment. It's creeping into some co congregations. You go in, you think you're at a, a R and B concert, Motown, Motown Philly, brother Danny. I mean, they're swaying, and it's like, hey, this is worship service. And I love how our, our uh, brother Wilcox said there are some congregations that you know they make people boom, 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 boom. You know, making making the sound of the bass. And they said, what's wrong with that? Well, if you had an actual bass in here, would it be wrong? Yes. So tell them, so that would be a sin then, right? Yes. What other sin can you mimic and it's okay? Let that sink on your heart for a minute. If you're saying bringing a bass or a mechanical instrument in here is a sin, and it's not in here, but you're making the sound, so you're mimicking that that God said is a sin. What other sin can you do that with? Last time I checked, you can't think of one. We sing with the fruit of our lips. Some people get, get uh, cute with going to the word orientation, but God knew what he put in his word. When you go all the way back to 2 Chronicles 29, and you actually see a full worship service, once they did the burnt offering, and I stress burnt offering, because out of all the offerings, the burnt offering, they gave the whole thing. What did Jesus give? The whole thing. He gave of them complete self. After that, they only sing. They weren't beatboxing. 
They weren't beating on something. They were just singing because they were on the other side of the sacrifice. Are we on the other side of the sacrifice? Amen. Yes, because Jesus only had to die once for us. I'll come right to you, Charles. I won't forget you. So being on the other side, why would we make any other sounds but singing? Charles, you got the floor. Some people use Psalm 150 as the reason why they use that to make music. <laughs> but you, you, you just missed my point. Psalm 150 isn't a worship service. When you go back and they say, because it's in the Old Testament, go, go to 2 Chronicles 29, do the whole chapter, you will see an entire worship service. There's a part where they only sing. And that part is after the burnt offering had been rendered. Our offering has been rendered. So why are we bringing in instruments? Even if we follow the Old Testament pattern, we would still only sing today. That's a powerful point. If y'all get a chance for homework, you got to read 2 Chronicles 29. It's about 30 verses. Read it and notice when they start singing. It's after the sacrifice. That makes sense? Thank you for your comment, Charles. We okay? Any questions or comments? We're down to verse 7 of Ephesians 3. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And I love this word, another word that's been polluted. What do we mean by minister? Are Gail and I the only ministers in the congregation? Mm -hmm. Why, sister? That's it. And that's literally the translation. You can go and minister unto people. I remember when I was attending Gould's, we had small group ministry. So you had agape or units, and every, every brother that led it up was considered a minister. Many times it's being used as a formal thing. No, minister, a uh, pastor can be a minister, but a minister doesn't necessarily have to be a pastor. So we clear on that? It says here, it says, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. What is that grace talking about? We use grace generally and specifically. What is this grace talking about here? Did God use a different measure of grace sometime? In the same book in Ephesians 2 around verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved, and not of yourself. Grace has many different layers. The first part of it, it brings us salvation. Grace is all God has put together to bring us to be reconciled to him. And we do that through faith. But God has extended his faith in many areas. Was there some, anybody named something that uh, Paul prayed about that God didn't solve for him? It was a problem. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Thorn in the side. That's what it was called, a thorn in the flesh. Said Paul prayed about it three times. God allowed him to keep it. So what was God saying? That's right. And, and God knew that he needed that for some reason. Now did Paul go around saying, I can't believe I still got this. Man, I'm supposed to be mighty apostle, whatever. He didn't complain. He prayed for it three times and that was it. And he moved on. Now the Bible didn't say why God had him to keep it. But bottom line, God blessed Paul to do many, di many different things, but he had him to keep that. So when you have something on you that you may not like, you never know what the end result could be. Yes, Sister Valerie. Oh, I was going to say that, that sometimes it keeps you humble. Yes. And sometimes it can be a pattern to you someone else do your business. Absolutely. You have to, in other words, you have to see it through God's eyes because you never know what he may have for it and where it makes it easier, that good old F word, the word of fellowship. We stay in fellowship, it becomes a little bit easier to bear. 
I think I told you all this story years ago. Uh, years ago, I had to have serious brain surgery. I mean, it was touch and go. I mean, those days when you pray and say, you feel like telling your wife, listen, if I don't make it, you know, it was one of those kind of days. Then they were talking about chemotherapy, which I really didn't want to deal with because they're shooting uh, radiation in your brain. And I've seen people I, that my former boss had a breast cancer. And when she came out of chemotherapy, she'd be talking to us. We'd look back over. She'd be knocked completely out. I was like, wow. So the day when they were making my mask, Steph and I was sitting there, the doctor called and said, we have a medication that we think will work. I still remember the name, lisinopril. And I said, wow, really? And he took it and that thing worked like a glove. It was beautiful. The day of, because I, I still had to decide. It had to lower the prolactin in my brain and it did. The prolactin, I got up to 17,000. Guess what was normal? 700. It got it down to 17 in 30 days. You don't think I was praising God? And you all were praying hard. And I'm so thankful for that. But that's not the gist of the story. The gist of the story, everything that I went through, a young lady was talking to Brother Lindsay. And Brother Lindsay said, this sounds like what Brother Rick went through. And Brother Lindsay connected us. And boy, we had a good old conversation. And she said, you have no idea. Her son went through it. And she said, she knew what to do because of what I told her. Now, how could I have told her if I didn't go through it? And then how would we have met if Lindsay didn't connect us? You see why we need each other in fellowship? To help us, because you all helped me go through it. Because I don't know if y'all remember, when I first came out, the doctor said my right eye would, I call myself a cyborg, because the right eye, when I turned and looked at you, my right eye was still coming around, and it would scare people, so I put on a mask so I could say I'm a Raider fan, just to look out. So, but it worked, it lasted for two weeks, and you all were praying. That's a moment in my life I will never forget. That's why we need each other. And that young lady sitting back there, Sister Natalie, the last time we went to uh, Lake Placid, my mom was overly energetic, jumping us up, jumping us up, and she got sick somehow. I guess it was the water. And I remember I happened to be sitting down beside her, and I saw her eyes just roll back, and I was like, oh, my goodness. So I grabbed her as she was falling back and laid her down. And thank God I had a nurse there, Sister Natalie in the back. She was able to tend to her. And then we call 911, and as you all know, she's fine. Lord's will, she'll be here this morning. This is why we need each other. And we have to be in tune with each other. We have a lot of gifted people here, too. Like I said, Sister Natalie's not just a Christian. She's a nurse. But that was a blessing I needed that day. Because I was shook for a minute. Even to the point where I said, I got to ride in the ambulance. And the lady said, okay, I was so thankful. Because when they opened up that back door, I wanted my mother to see my face. And it was nice. I was able to jump out, run around back. They opened the door. My mom was sitting up and she saw my face and I saw the smile. I said, that's what I'm talking about. That wasn't because of me. That was because God allowed it. Amen. But because if we had a good people there to support. And that's what we have in this congregation, praise God. Getting back to our text. Verse 8, notice Paul's verbiage here. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul called himself the least of saints. Why would he say that when he did so many great things in the New Testament? Brother Charles, again. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Paul knows. We know when Paul was Paul, he was what? What was his name? Saul. What was Saul doing? Persecuting the church. Remember Stephen, the first documented Christian martyr? What was Paul doing while they were stoning Peter? Holding the coats. He even sought letters from saints being sent out so he could get the addresses so he could go and drag them out. 
Paul was relentless. The thing about it, God saw that relentlessness because he thought, the thing about Saul was he thought he was doing right. But then when God revealed to him that that was wrong and the right way to do it, he used that same energy for the right. But he still kept himself humble, remembering some of the disastrous things he did. I've heard people, especially brother, and I wish I could have that energy. I said, you remember when you were unsaved? When the, the party started at eight, but you had to get there at one? And then the party ended at three, but you closed it down at six. Where'd all that energy go, brother Dado? Going partying all night long, chasing women all night long, but still get up and go to work. But now, okay, get the Bible study so early. Where'd all, where'd all, all that energy go? It's where we choose to put it. We got it. It's where we choose to put it. But we have to remember we have that energy. But Paul used it as a motivation more so than holding down. Paul said, I'm the least, so I'm going to do. And how did God use Paul? How many books are in the, in the New Testament? 27, right? God allowed Paul to pen through the Holy Spirit a good 85% of those books. That's, I don't know the last time you checked math. That's a good chunk. For somebody who persecuted the church, that shows how God looks at the heart. When Paul changed, he changed and he gave it all. Who are we not to do the same thing? Questions, comments, confusion. I like you all's energy. I can feel it. Verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Somebody tell me, why do we use the terms principalities and powers? We're going to read more about that in a chapter to come, but why would he use the term principalities and powers? I'm going to give you a clue. The clue is Ephesians 6. I'll give you a few minutes, scholar. Remember, as Christians, we're in warfare, in spiritual warfare, right? Yeah. When we read it, my, matter of fact, my sermon last Sunday night dealt with this, in Ephesians 6 and 10. It says, for we, you can all finish this, for we wrestle not against what comes next, but against principalities, against powers, evil powers in heavenly places. This is why Paul makes this clear. We need to know where our fight is, and we need to know how we're going to fight. The last people we should be fighting with for a long period of time, we can have disagreements, but the last people we should be fighting with is our brothers and sisters. Anybody ever watched the NBA championships lately? I've been, we should at least follow your hometown. You know, I'm, fo I'm following Miami Heat. Now, how would you feel if the Miami Heat, let's say, was playing LA Lakers and one of the Miami Heat is constantly scoring on the wrong basketball, on the, on the wrong basketball hoop? It's like, what is that man doing? He keeps dunking on the wrong end of the, of the, the your hoops down here. What is he in the essence doing? Yeah, he's helping the other team win, is he not? Now, as clear as that sounds, and we would be going off if you bought tickets and paid for that expensive parking. It's like, I'm going to come here to see this. How do you think God feels when we argue and we don't resolve our conflicts? Because all we're doing is giving room for who to slide right in. That's exactly right. And it's just that simple. Take an opportunity to read some history of how church split. Many of them started with one little disagreement and not liking one elder. So then it became a click. And then that click after a while said, we're gonna go ahead and start our own work. And I'm sad to say, that's how a lot of congregations have gotten started. Folks, that's not Bible-based. We gotta call, I told people, we gotta call that like it is. Men were sent out to establish congregations. You didn't just retreat and start your own. That's exactly what you did. You started your own work. That's shameful, according to what I see in scripture. That's the first bell, right? 
Any questions, comments about that? We all, and that requires us, us all to do our part. You know, you've heard about these gun shootings lately. You know what's the number one reason why it happened? And I'm not blaming people that do this. I'm just saying this is the number one reason why it happens. It starts off with an unresolved conflict. And then they come looking for that person. I'm taking a school shooting class as we speak right now, and it's amazing some of the stuff you find out. They come looking, let's say if I had a, 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 a disagreement with Steve, it was like, oh, all right, all right, no, 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 we're just going back and forth. And then we leave. That's unresolved, right? So then I lay down. Like Steve called me a fish-eyed fool. How dare he do that? Well, I got something to him. And I rolled up looking for Steve, and I shoot Steve, and everybody ended up shooting up the place. Where did it start from? An unresolved issue. We all have a responsibility in keeping that down. In a school that Gail and I ran called Bay Point Schools, one of the things that they taught us that is legendary. It said, if ever, and in that place, we could actually put our hands on kids if they jump bad. You ain't got to back down. So we had, a, we had a tight school. But one of the things we did, if ever we put our hands on a kid or I had to get physical or restrain a kid, we always took the time to get back with him and say, listen, you understand why I did that? It wasn't like, yeah, I bet you won't do it again. No, I said, like, you understand why I did that? Now you jumped up, you jumped up in my face, you invaded my space. We called it neutralization. We always let the kid know why it happened and try to repair his dignity. As much as we could, we tell the other kids, this is how you're supposed to take it. When you're wrong, we can make it right, right? Yeah. We never had any issues with kids jumping on us. These are some of the kids we saw in the community too. They would come up much respect because we gave them their dignity back. And we have to remember that. You know, the Bible says we're given the, the, uh, the ministry of reconciliation. Now that's ultimately called bringing people to Christ, but there's a principle there. Their principle is you're making it right with God. If you have an issue with somebody, you have a responsibility to make it right so that there's nothing left there that people may take the wrong way. Does that make sense? We're gonna close out. Any closing comments or questions? Because you know, if you don't, you may, you may urge me to fire up a quick quiz on you guys. Questions, comments, confusion. We all right? You all understood everything I covered? I trust you. Please bow with me in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Heavenly Father, before worship to dig into your word. We hope, trust, and pray that everything that was explained was received, Heavenly Father, with the love that it was studied in, Heavenly Father. And may we take it, Heavenly Father, into the world and make this world a better place to the best of our ability, most importantly, bringing souls to Christ. This is our prayer in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.